Five seconds. So I guess Sabina's the official counter. Nope, we are live already. <laughs> well, good evening. We're glad you're here tonight. Um, we have the clock on the back wall and my phone, and I don't know what Sabina's looking at, but uh, trying to figure out what time we're going live. So, But we're glad you're here tonight. Um, let me begin with prayer. Um, yeah, let me begin with prayer. God, we come to you tonight, Lord, and just first want to recognize that you are a great God, that you are a good God, Lord, that um, you ultimately put kings in place and remove kings, Lord, and God, that you are good and faithful uh, no matter what, Lord, and we and our hope is ultimately in you. But God, we do pray for our country tonight, Lord, and um, especially over the next several days, which looks like it could just um, become very ugly, Lord, and not something our country is used to in elections, God. And so, Lord, we just we pray um, for you to work, Lord. We pray that uh, justice would be done, Lord, that, um, yeah, God, that you would just work. And, Lord, we trust you again and know that you're good. And just, God, pray that uh, you would just help us to remember that our hope is ultimately in you, and we are citizens of your kingdom. And God, we pray as we look at your word tonight that you would just encourage us, um, help us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, for those of you that were not here at Men's Bible Study this morning, um, we are coming back inside on Sunday. Uh, so we will be inside. Um, had hoped to stay outside as long as we could because I think that gives them, makes allows for the most people to come comfortably, um, but the fact that the high last time I looked on Sunday is supposed to be 55 and it's like 60% chance of rain, um, I don't think anybody would be comfortable outside. So, um, yeah, I mean, may, I, we're, we're in California. I, we, most of us probably don't even have long underwear. I, I never, when we moved to Kentucky, was the first time I'd heard of lined pants where you can buy like jeans that have or like docker pants with flannel inside. I was like, that is the greatest invention ever. Who knew? And apparently everybody that lives back there and up north knows about that, but I'm from California, so. <laughs> Wait. You know, you haven't shrunk back into him yet? What are you saying that he, has, he used to have a pair, but he outgrew them? But, oh, Long John's. I, Costco for Long John's. All right, you heard it here first if you're looking for Long John's. They have lined jeans at Costco? And apparently they're on sale right now. So, at Costco. Hey, who knew you'd get this kind of up-to-date information at church, at Bible study, we're on the cutting edge here. <laughs> All right. Now the bad jokes are coming out. Dennis just said he thought you went to Long John's to get fish. Um, so we are in James tonight, and uh, speaking of Long John Silvers, uh, I haven't been to Long John Silvers in a long, long time, but there's one over on Shaw Avenue. I noticed that they have all-you-can-eat fish on Sundays. Um, but Sabina has no desire to go there. She doesn't like fish and doesn't like, like fried food. So uh, one Sunday when Sabina and the girls were somewhere, I don't know where they were at, Jack and I went over and got all-you-can-eat fish, and he got all-you-can-eat chicken. And um, it was good. It was good. I felt terrible later, but it was good <laughs> while it lasted there. So, yeah. Was it free? No. They're, they're, they're trying to make money, so it was all you can eat. But yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get started. So we are in James, and we looked last week um, at verses. Uh, I think just last week we just looked at verse thirteen, but we're in this paragraph here, and uh, verses twelve through fifteen make up one paragraph. And James says in verse twelve, "Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial." For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is 
tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so we talked about verse 12 that James is trying to encourage us um, in temptations and in trials to stand firm, to be steadfast. And he says that it's the person who stands the test that will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those that love him. So there's different motivations um, for really anything we do. Uh, and, the, and you have, all, again, both in the Bible. There are uh, positive reinforcements and negative reinforcements. We do this all the time with our children. If you do that, you will receive this consequence negative. Um, or if you do that, you will get this thing positive. If you don't clean your room, you're going to bed half an hour early. Um, if you get good grades, we'll buy you ice cream. That kind of thing, we, we do both. And what you have here with this uh, promise of the crown of life is James is saying, look forward to the future, look forward to the reward. And I think sometimes we're, um, we've kind of told ourselves that that's not a good way to, to live life, is, is looking for the reward. But it is definitely one of the things that Scripture makes very, very clear um, about how we live, is that we look forward to what is to come. And... Um, So in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus was looking forward as he went through the crucifixion and everything. He was looking forward to the end goal, God's glory, our salvation. And then you go back one more, one more chapter in Hebrews, and in Hebrews 11, verse 5, it begins to talk about Enoch and talks about how he was taken up and didn't see death. Um, and at the end of verse 5, it says, Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So as in, in um, commending Enoch, he says two things. He believed God and believed that God rewards. And so the, the, the way that it's not that, hey, he didn't do anything. It's he believed God and believed the promises of God. And so we have both of those types of um, motivations in Scripture. The negative, if you do this, here are the consequences. And then here are the positive, stand firm through trials because that's how you get the crown of life. It's the people that stand firm. So we talked about that. Uh, we talked about verse 13 that we cannot say or God does not tempt people. Um, God will test people, but he doesn't tempt people. And tonight we'll get to, the, to that definition, to a better definition or clear definition of what temptation is. Um, and then we talked about the fact that God cannot be tempted. Um, he's invincible to assault. He can't be, um, yeah, he, he can't be tempted. God in his righteousness and in his holiness, um, just that sin just isn't appealing to him in any way. So, um, God can't be tempted. So we come tonight to verses 14 and 15, and he gives just a really, really clear picture of what temptation is. But he says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So, um, first... How should we go about this? Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the process first. So he says each person is tempted. Well, no, we'll start. With, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. So let's talk about this. So let's say that you're a fish, okay? And that's you. And he says that you're lured and enticed, okay? I didn't draw this to good scale. But this is, this is the sin or the temptation, right? It's the hook. Okay, and everybody has some different kind of bait that's on that hook. For um, you know, it, it could be anything. For those of us that you know, it could be uh, you know jeeps that you, you know, struggle over those and, and want jeeps. That's a terrible jeep. Um, whatever it may be, whatever your temptation is, it could be things, it could be power, it could be wealth, it could be uh, relationships or recognition or that kind of thing. Whatever that. Um, Whatever that is, that's the thing that's luring and enticing you. Now, here's my question for you. 
is, ooh, we got colors. That's water. Okay. What, what is up here in the boat? What is, what is dropping that line? Or who is dropping that line? The fisherman. What is it? Yeah, that, what, what does he say here? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So it's our own desires, and I realize I didn't do this big enough. I should have started lower. I apologize. But it's our own desires that cause this to be a lure and a temptation. For some of you, you're like, I think all Jeeps look like that. I would never be tempted by a Jeep. That's just dumb. Well, you're not me. Um, and like I said, so, so for everybody, it, it's something different. And for some people, what, what's on the hook isn't a temptation at all. You know, this fish over here, we'll go a little blue fish. Dory. Um, this fish may not be tempted by this, but what is it that makes that a temptation? It's our own desires. Now, why is it important that we recognize that it is our desires that lure and, and tempt us? Gary? Yeah. Yeah, personal responsibility, right? That's what it comes down to. Is if we, because what, what are other things that people would say are in the boat? The devil made me do it. The devil, the devil made me do it right? Well, it's not my fault. I mean, you, all the time, like, oh, they made me so angry. Well, I wouldn't have done this if they wouldn't have whatever. Yeah, we blame other people for our sin. That person made me do it. I remember my, one of my roommates, Scott, um, he was supposed to be studying for a test, and we, we talked him into going to the movies with us, um, and then he blamed us when he didn't do well on the test. That's his own, that's his fault, right? <laughs> he was weak. Um, so other people can lead us into temptation, but we, we have a tendency to want to blame our sin and our failures, our weaknesses on other people when we really have to understand that it, it is our own desires. Okay? So that's the picture that, that he's painting here. We can't say, well, the devil made me do it or that person made me do it. And like Sabina said, um, you know, people are just the opportunity for what's in our heart to come out. And so that's it. So does that, that make, that's the picture he's getting, that lured and enticed. It's the picture of fishing or, or being trapped. Make sense? Okay. So that's, that's the picture. And then he, he, demonst- he uh, talks about a process there. What is the process? I should have left that up longer so you could admire my awesome artwork. Well, I'll give you a hint. Oh, yep, I did that backwards. I went to the end. (laughs) I did take biology. Okay, so what's the first? So you're lured and enticed, and then desire is, or uh, sin is conceived. Desire is conceived, gives birth to sin. I always panic when I get to E's and I's, and I'm writing in front of a bunch of people. So it's conceived, and then what happens? It's birth. It's birth. And then what happens? Yeah. So there's maturity or it's fully grown and death. Okay. So this is, there's a process to sin. And, and we recognize that. That if we are, if you take it to the ultimate, um, that living in sin equals death spiritually, right? If we don't put our faith in Jesus Christ, if we, if we live in and enjoy our sin, it brings about death. And I think what James is doing here is he's giving us a warning. And I think this is one of those, uh, the, those uh, negative... Uh, <laughs> I was just talking about this earlier. Yeah, positive and negative motivations motivations this is a negative motivation to hey here's the consequences of what happens so for us as christians we want to take sin very very seriously because if we allow sin to reign in our lives and the general direction of our life is away from god and that's that's the that's the norm of life is away from god then we have to question whether we really know him and have been made alive in the spirit or if we are really dead in our trespasses and sins 
And, you know, the Christian life, we know there's going to be ups and downs to it. But what James is doing here is he's saying, take sin seriously, because if you don't, it will lead to death. Um, so there's the, there's the ultimate side of that. And then there's the, the more practical side. When you look at 1 Corinthians 11, and you look at where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, and he warns them, and he says, check yourself, right? See, see what you're doing. And he says, um, because some people have taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, some of them are sick and have even died. And so God does discipline, and in some cases, disciplines to the point of death. So I think this is a warning to James. He's not saying you can lose your salvation, but he's saying you need to take sin seriously. And if the general character of your life is for decades and decades and decades away from God, then there's a good... Um, there's reason to say you're dead in your trespasses and sins and not you have not been made alive in Christ. So I think that's the point there that he is, is um, getting at. Um, so here's another way to think about this. So um, what, would, what does this look like in our minds and, and, and in our hearts? Okay? So I would say that this is desire. So there, there's a desire in my heart, and that is the sin being conceived, right? And then there's a deception in the mind. Okay? What do I mean? What kind of deception in the mind? Does that make sense? What am I thinking there? Or... Yeah, believing lies, um, untrue things about God, self-deception, um, justification, I think would be there. What would you say, Gary? Weighing the consequences and deciding. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then here, I would say then you have design, or you begin, so it's, you desire, you justify, or deceive in your mind, and then you design, you make plans um, to do it, and then you have action and consequences. Basically, nurturing your sin will cause death. Yeah, yeah, what Carrie just said is nurturing your sin will cause death, and that is, that is very, very true. So here's another way for us to think about it. Um, now, one of the big questions is, at what, at what point are we sinning? At what point are we sinning? Gary. When you nurture your desire, your God-given desire, beyond God's limits or boundaries, then it's time to repent. Yeah. 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 Yeah
but the heart is exactly the same. Um, and one way I like to think about it, and I, I'm just gonna put a, I'm gonna put a monster, I'm gonna write monster because I can't think of how to draw a monster. Yeah. So there was a guy that wrote a book, and he he had this uh, picture of a monster, and he had everybody. Um, he said, you know, we're we're chained to this monster. Um, that's supposed to be a chain. Um, so we're chained to the monster. Okay, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And when you, when you uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are no longer chained to that monster. You don't serve that monster anymore. You're, you're set free. You're not a slave to sin anymore. But the monster is still there. And then we make a decision either to feed the monster or to starve the monster. And what made me think of it is when you guys were talking about nurturing, is as I, if I feed this monster, he gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? But if I starve the monster, he gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. There you go. Yeah, that red, (laughs) Gary's showing a picture of the uh, alien from Marvin the Martian cartoons, big red guy and had the like converse shoes. Isn't that Marvin the Martian? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he shows up with Marvin, Marvin, Martian, yeah. Um, to, total side note that has anything to do, I, never mind, I'm not going to chase that rabbit. Okay, so we don't, we want to feed it, we want to starve the monster rather than feed it, and if we feed it, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and move us down through this process. Um, so, at what point are we committing sin? Danny brought up, you know, the Sermon on the when to lust after a woman is the same as adultery, so it's the same heart. And then in Philippians 4.8, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So that's what we're called to do. And I would say that anything that is the opposite of any of those, we are entering into this process and into sin. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So what Rob was asking is it says that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. So, so Rob's version says evil desire. Um, yeah, and I think it, and that's a fine translation. I don't have the Greek memorized or know the Greek off the top of my head, but if it's luring and enticing us away from God, it's an evil desire. So I don't, I don't think, yeah. The cross-reference here is in Proverbs 19.3 where it says, where it says, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Okay, so there's a cross-reference to Proverbs that says, Say it again. Proverbs what? Proverbs 19, 3. Um, the Greek actually means uh, longing, desire. Um, I think they add evil so that you'll understand I, the, what it, is their meaning. Yeah. What James means in the context, maybe, but um, the actual Greek word just means a longing, a desire, or a lust. So what Sabina is saying is that the, the Greek actually means like a longing, a lust, a craving. And so to put evil desire in there gives a better, clearer picture of than just desire. Yeah. Yeah, because that would, that would make me just think, if I were new to the faith, that would make me think that any desire that I had, like if I wanted to order a Jeep, that's evil and I shouldn't think that. Right, that's very true. And it's very true to clarify that wanting a Jeep is not necessarily an evil desire. But, yeah, we don't... Uh, <laughs> 
So one, to go back to the beginning, we know he's writing to believers because he starts everything out with, count it all joy, my brothers. And so he, he's talking to, to fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, and then in verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. And so I, I think it's really clear in the context he's talking to Christians. But one of the things that is true about James, it is, is an extremely practical book. Um, and I agree with you. I think these are uh, admonitions mm -hmm. uh, from James because uh, believers might have been tempted to go back to their way of life with the light of Christ. And yeah. They might be tempted to turn away from the Lord rather than to take the, the trial of the test of suffering. Yeah, and, and what, what Rob is saying is that, you know, as a, as a Christian, there's a temptation to turn away from the Lord when you're going through trials and temptation. And we go back to our little fish hook story security and, and peace is a, can be a huge um, lure and enticement into sin. Is that, you know what, it, it's hard to stand for the Lord, and so I'll just, to, to be secure and to make sure, and, you know, I think about it, Hebrews, you know, where it says that they, they were being ridiculed and thrown into prison and um, or seeing their friends thrown into prison, like if that's happening, there's a huge temptation to just go, you know what, I'm just going to kind of step away from that Jesus stuff because I don't want that to happen to me. And yeah, I mean, that, that's a huge temptation. So again, I think James is really trying to encourage them in this. And, and going back to, to your original question, like the desire, can Christians have evil desires? It, it's not like Satan evil, like, <laughs> but it's it's the desire to disobey God. It's the sin. And I think, I think of Romans six fifteen. It says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one who you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are, were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now you present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit, of, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus your Lord. And then he goes on, he continues to talk about the law and sin. And you have in chapter 7 where he says, verse 15, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate and so that goes back to this, to this chain thing, is when we were sinners, we were chained to the monster. We were slaves of sin. But now we've been set free from that, but we still have this, we can still present ourselves to sin, and we don't have to sin anymore, like when we were chained to the monster, but there are times where you know, our, our, sin, our sinful nature, this the fact that we're still fallen humans um, will get the best of us. Okay? Um, all right. We're going to go through the next three pages in like 12 minutes, okay? We'll listen fast. You guys listen fast. Um, so this battle with sin, one, it's a battle to the death. Um, so three verses I'll read for you real quick. Um, Romans 8, 6 and 13, and then Colossians 3, 5. Can you guys see that? Romans 8, 6 and 13. So Romans 8, 6 says, to set, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So he says, if you set your mind on on the flesh, that's death. That's living by desire. That's just, that's going to lead you to death. But if you set your mind on the spirit, that's life and peace. So we are in a battle to the death. And then later in the chapter, he says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So again, as Paul goes through Romans 8, 
And remember, he starts 8.1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ, and he ends the chapter with you can't be separated from the love of Christ. But in the middle, he says, here's the practical side, is sin, it'll eat you up. And if you don't turn to Christ totally, and in, in, in he becomes your whole hope, sin will lead, will lead you to death. Um, and uh, so we need to be killing sin. John Owen I meant to bring it. He's got a little book called The Mortification of Sin, which just means to kill, the killing of sin. And he says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Okay? Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's not a neutral thing. And then he says this. He says, sin aims always at the utmost. Every time it rises up to tempt or entice, if it is allowed to have its own course, it would go to the utmost sin of every kind. Every clean thought or glance would be adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. Every thought of unbelief would be atheism if it is allowed to grow to its head. And so he's kind of restating what Jesus said. When Jesus said, to lust is to commit adultery, what John Owen is saying is if you don't check sin here, it's going to take you all the way. And so the sooner we check sin, the sooner we kill sin in our lives, the better off we're going to be because there is no such thing as sin just saying, well, I just, I just want to be conceived and then, then we'll stop. It's going to take you all the way. Because the farther along you are, the more you set it and the stronger it is, the yeah. more likely it is that you can defeat it. Right. I mean, obviously with Christ, you can, but the less likely to defeat it. Right. Yep. So you're less likely to, to defeat it. This, what Sabina was saying is that you're less likely to defeat it the more you feed it and the bigger it grows. And that's, you know, you see that happen to people where they're just like, I've got this monster sin in my life and I have no idea how I got here. Well, it was because you fed it and fed it and fed it and you were sneaking it scraps under the table. Um, so, uh, John Owen gives three steps in the process of sin. And I want to write that right above this because I think it's just helpful. Um, so number one, I'm going to read what he says and then try to summarize, okay? Um, he says, number one, perspective is lost on the vileness of sin and the wonder of God's grace. So perspective is lost on the vileness of sin and the wonder of God's grace. So we forget, I'm going to write this in shorter language, we forget that God hates sin And we forget his grace. Okay, he says that's, that's the first step. That's what leads to this conception and this desire. We forget that sin is absolutely uh, repugnant, an abomination to God. Um, he says sin's tendency is always to lessen sin's seriousness. Biblical truth loses its grip on the imagination is reduced to a mere cognitive to mere cognitive content. As spiritual sensitivities are dulled, the saint loses that holy relish that had been the primary motivation for his or her life. So basically just like the we forget his grace, we forget that sin that God hates sin, just kind of our spiritual excitement dulls and we forget who God is. Um, number 2 Sin appears in the imagination. So we imagine it. Yeah, Gary said the heart of man is desperately wicked and beyond all cure. Jeremiah? <laughs> all right. It's in Jeremiah somewhere. We both agree on that. Um, but the heart of man is, is desperately wicked, and we have this draw. And so what happens in sin is, and it kind of goes along with, with this here is that we forget that God hates it, we forget His grace, and then we begin to, begin to contemplate it. It arises in the mind. Um, this is what John Owen said. He says, When the affections are not firmly set on the things of God, sin's attractiveness makes its appearance in the imagination. As sin is contemplated without a corresponding sense of disgust, it captures the imagination and becomes positively desirable. So when that disgust goes away, it becomes a desire. 
I uh, uh, worked at a summer camp for a week. Um, well, I, must, my, I think the summer between my junior and senior year of high school, I had this cabin full of sixth grade boys. And girls, to some of them, were disgusting. And some of them had begun to forget that girls were disgusting. And they became, and there, there was a lot of imagining going along, right? And I'm not sure why that popped into my mind as imagination, because I'm not saying all girls are just it's a sin. But, but we, we, we know that, right? Because that happens in, in sin. Something that, you know, three, four, five years ago, you thought was just like, ah, I would never do that. Sometimes you think, how did I end up here? Well, you forgot it was disgusting, and then the mind begins to go. Um, and then number three, he says, the will gives consent and the mind justifies. So the will consents and the mind justifies. Yep. So the will says, ah, It'll be fine. And then the mind goes, and here's how we can make it work. Here's why it's okay. And so you see in Owen just the, kind of this similar progression. Both of these things are, um, are, are running wild there. And uh, what Owen says is if this chain of deceit is not broken, then you end up in deep sin. He says... Um, this is what he says. He says, The affections are stirred and inflamed by the vivid representations of the pleasure of sin, while the convictions and conscience are silenced. If this chain of deceit is not broken, it leads to sinful attitudes and actions. Later, after indwelling sin has developed a habit pattern, the cycle can occur so quickly that there is no longer any consciousness of stages or parlaying and enticing. Instead, the behavior erupts swiftly and with little warning. So you get what he's saying there? He says, you know, you can go through this process, and if you're a mature believer, you can look back and go, wow, that, I can totally see that process. But the more you give in to indwelling sin, you go from here to here in a heartbeat. And so again, it comes back to this, for us as Christians, we need to be killing sin, cutting it off as early in the process as we can, because um, sin's desire is, is to consume you. Its, its desire is to control us. Its desire is to rip us away from God. Um, what? Yeah, guard the heart because from it throat flows the um, wellspring of life. Wellspring of life? Yeah. Um, so you think about this in the garden. So they began to, well, to eat it's not wrong. And then they began to ponder it. And they decide they want to be like God. And so they just, they go, okay, we want to be like God. And they, their will comes into play and they justify and give consent. Um, then you have David. He forgets adultery is wrong. And he did that actually way before Bathsheba, right? right? I mean, or at least he forgot that the, the call to love one woman. And so he, he's abandoned that and then he sees Bathsheba and he begins to, begins to imagine and sends somebody and comes up with a reason. I'm the king. And I think that's, that's like, in, in essence, that's what we're saying anytime we're, we're sinning is I'm the king. This is my castle. I rule this. And God's saying, no, I'm the king. But in sin, it's, it's our own prideful hearts. Yeah. Yeah, what Gary is saying is that we're not only forgetting that God hates sin, we're forgetting that he is the king and we have no right to, to disobey him. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we need to cut off sin as early in the process as possible. Uh, there's a book that's called um, Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges. And it's easy, I think it's easier to, to look at this list and think about the big things like Adam and Eve, you know, sinning and casting all mankind into um, a sinful nature, or David and Bathsheba and adultery. But this same thing is true in the, in the little things of life, too, is if we don't cut things off early, they will um, just lead off and have the ability to consume us. So here are the, these are the chapter titles in his book, Respectable Sins. 
And what he means by respectable sins is he's like, these are sins that the church has forgotten that God hates, and they're just, they're respectable. People are like, ah, it's not a big deal. We all deal with that. But in reality, they're not okay. But in reality, they're not okay. These, these are sins. So um, chapter one, anxiety and frustration. Chapter two, discontentment, unthankfulness, pride, selfishness, lack of self-control, impatience and irritability. That's a tough one. Anger, judgmentalism, legalism, envy, jealousy, sins of the tongue, and worldliness. God hates all of those. But yet we have a tendency to go, eh, I can let that one go a little ways. Because you don't know how, I mean, that guy cut me off in traffic. I'll let that one go a little ways. But we need to be bringing all of those um, under control. So, how do, you, how do you battle this? What do you do? Yeah, Danny. Well, we're all flesh, okay? That flesh, is, the desires of the flesh is, is where sin is conceived and carried out. Mm-hmm. As a believer, by accepting Christ, when we look at the things that are good and righteous and perfect, well, well, that's God and His work. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way Jesus battled with sin when He was tempted was by recalling the work. We're given the gift of the Spirit. On that desire and that conception, if we've been in the Word, I feel that the Spirit reveals His Word, and then we have a choice to make to either take that Word as truth or reject it, which is the basis of sin, rejecting the Word of God and going our own way. But Mm -hmm. as a believer, we've been given what is good, and we've been given the Spirit to bring that to mind in those moments of desire. Whether we accept it and walk with it is when it turns into sin. Uh, you know, I talked earlier as far as the um, looking at a woman with desire. The second you do that, well, that's your, your, your sister in Christ. That's somebody else's wife, daughter. Um, you look at that in his word that it's wrong, and you mm-hmm. can shut down those desires. The second you don't, you have stepped into sin because you, you've rejected what's good and right and perfect. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so what Danny is saying is that, you know, we have these desires and we have to go back to God's word. And when we leave God's word, that's where we're really in trouble. And that's what God used, or what's what Jesus used to battle temptation was, was going back to God's word. I think this is one of those really, I mean, I had this discussion with somebody this week, is like when sin is really just a, it's an issue of desire. And when you desire this, it's really hard just to go, I'm not going to desire that anymore. And so we have to replace it with something else. And so we replace it with God's word. Yeah, Rob. Uh, you said something earlier, uh, I didn't catch it all, but you said something earlier about us uh, being kings. Or we we want to be king. king. I'm the king. We want to be king. Yeah. Okay, we want to be king. And so that's our downfall, because we want yeah. to be king. But that made me think of... Uh, Judges 21, 25, the very last verse in, in uh, Judges. Uh-huh. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. That's repeated several times throughout Judges. Yeah. yeah. Rob brought up you know, the, the, the end of Judges, and then you know, it's re- actually repeated throughout Judges, but Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Right. And, and that's... So if, if we are our own king, well, you know, we're just going to do what we think is right. So where it starts is we have to recognize who is king, who is the king. Yeah. And we have to be, we have to come under his authority. And if we don't do that every time we are tempted, then that desire starts to become a problem. That yeah. desire. Well, what, what, for those of you online, what Rob is saying is that it really does come back to that issue of who's king. We have to recognize who's king. And that comes back to this, this one up here, too, forgetting that God hates sin, forgetting his grace, forgetting that it is his grace that makes us one of his children and allows us to be a citizen of his kingdom. Like, that, that's it. And when 
when our, when our desires carry us away from God, we're denying that he's king. We're saying we want to be our own king. We want to be the ones that make the laws. We want to be the ones that say what's good and right and perfect. And so it, it just goes back to, to that remembering who God is. So I would say that the battle here really comes down to one thing, or one way to think about it, is what do you do to battle sin? And it's talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. Um, yeah, preach the gospel to yourself. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, most unhappiness in your life is because you're listening to yourself rather than talking to yourself. And what we, we means by listening to ourselves is we're listening to our desires that want to carry us this way rather than telling ourselves things that are true. God is the king. God is good. God saved me. Obedience to, to him. First uh, John 5, 3, his commandments are not burdensome. Uh, Matthew 16, 28, is that the, my, um, take, up my, take up my yoke, uh, my burden is easy. I just butchered that verse, but somebody knows that, right? Anybody? Bueller? Okay. Is this, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that 16, 28? We're still looking for it. Hold on. Take my yoke upon you. 15, 28. Nope. It's not 1528. No, it's not 1528. We'll find it at some point. But we'll find it for you, Woody. <laughs> but it's, it, that, that's what Jesus... Like, we have to keep telling ourselves that all the time. Like, no, obedience to God is what's best. And we keep going back to the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Like, he loves me. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me. Um, in Romans 8, there's an interesting verse. Um, it's Romans 8, 12. He says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. And, I, and I, that just, just reminds me of how many times in life do we look back at our old sinful lives and go, Oh, that, was, you know, that, that wasn't that bad. Like, that was kinda... And then when you stop yourself and go, Wait a second, that was bad. Like, when you start talking to yourself and remembering you the true things, and you remember, no, that was actually a horrible time in my life. But sometimes we think that we owe the old life something, and Paul here is saying, we're not debtors to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. Because the flesh's desire, Satan's desire, sin's desire, is to kill you dead. And if you're a Christian... There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. You can't be separated from the love of Christ. So he's going to do the best he can do, and that's just make you sick, weak, pitiful, pathetic, and useless in God's kingdom. And that's what sin will do. Make you as good as dead, dead spiritually in God's kingdom. So we have to talk to ourselves, just tell ourselves things that are true, things that are true, that are true, because we live in a world that's just telling us false things all the time. And don't get caught up in that. Yeah, Woody. Take my yoke yep. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight is the gentle and lowly. Yep. And and that's just a beautiful. He is. Gentle and lowly, Jesus is kind and gracious and a good person to run to. All right? Um, let me end with this. Um, uh, So Woody was talking about a book about a boy that loses his shadow, and the metaphor is, is about losing your soul. Um, so I, uh, one of the shows, 
uh, that I used to like to watch, and every once in a while on YouTube will pull up. It's called Dog Fights, and it's a terrible name because it's not talking about like Bow Wow dogs. It's talking about airplanes, and, and so they they go through old fights and they'll interview the the pilots and that kind of thing if they're near enough. And um, they interviewed a guy named uh, Robbie Reisner, and he was flying. Um, Jets in 1952, and on September 15th, 1952, and they interviewed him. I told this story once, and a guy was like, that is not true. It's not impossible. They interviewed him. They were flying um, uh, F-86 Sabres, which have uh, the intake is on the front, so it's a snub-nosed plane with a big hole in the front, okay? So um, they're flying, and they're chasing a MiG, and they fly back across the riverbank, and Reisner... um, Reisner shoots down the MiG, and his, wing, his wingman is Joe Logan, and so Joe's job is to hang with him, and Reisner shoots down the MiG, and as they pull out and begin to head for um, safety, they have to go 100 miles to get back over the ocean and where it's safe, and um, as they begin to turn, uh, Robbie Reisner realizes that Joe's plane has been hit, and he's not going to make it the 100 miles. So Reisner brings his jet around and puts his nose on the tail of his buddy Joe Logan's plane and pushes him. And that's where the guy was like, that's impossible. But if you've seen a picture of the plane, this is actually possible. And they were interviewing the guy. They were interviewing Robbie Reisner. And so he pushes Joe out over the sea. And um, Joe, and there, there's actually two... two um, there's a rescue plane, a seaplane, and a helicopter there. They're arguing over who is going to rescue Joe. Okay? And so Reisner heads off to home. Joe ejects. And then doesn't come home. Because he got tangled in his parachute cords and drowned. And it just broke Robbie's heart. And, and as I, I had heard that story, and then I was, I was doing stuff looking at you know Romans 8 and the battle against sin and everything, it just made me think of, how many Christians do amazing, incredible things for the Lord just to get tangled up in the end and, and fall into sin? And it, made me think of, it makes me think of Hebrews 12, where he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So for us as Christians, this is all stuff that's going to tangle us up. It, it causes us to trip and stumble and not run the race well. And so we just have to be a people that takes seriously saying no to sin. Um, cut it off as early in the process as you can. And um, whatever measures you have to take to do that, you will be happy you did. Because the joy and satisfaction that comes in obedience to God is better than anything this world has to offer. And Sabina says, amen, and we have to tell ourselves that over and over and over again because the world's always going, here, little boy, I've got candy. And we have to go, no, that is not good. All right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll all look at AJ now. Or a young lady. So, were you going to say something, Gary? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Have a plan. That, that's what Gary's saying. Don't make a provision for the flesh. If you know that you don't like whatever, if there, you know that whatever is on that hook is a temptation for you, have a plan. And the plan, first plan is turn and swim the other way. Run away. Run away. Right? That's what Joseph did when Potiphar's wife you know, grabbed him. He just ran. And he was like, I don't care if I'm naked. I'm running away. Get out now. And God, and God was faithful to him. God was faithful to him. All right? So thanks for being here. Um, we'll say goodnight to you guys that are on YouTube and Facebook, and then we'll spend just a few minutes praying here. Um, I went really long again. I apologize. But um, hopefully you were encouraged, and uh, we'll continue to battle sin. All right? Okay. Um, well, let's pray.